so here we are. Jesus is talking in the Sermon on the Mount, and, and he, he uses an illustration of two men building a house, right? And, and as we looked at it last week, we determined that this illustration was not really about a house. It was about the building of our lives in the presence of the Lord. And, and so he told a story about two men. There was the foolish man. And this foolish man, he built his life upon what Jesus called the sand. There, there was absolutely no foundation in this man's life. So when the storms of life arose, and they always arise, they will never not arise. So the storms of life come into this foolish man's life, and Scripture says that his house, his life, fell apart. It came crashing to the ground. Well, Jesus spoke also of a wise man, and and the wise man built his house on the solid foundation of Jesus' word. And when the storms of life came in this man's life, they were completely unable to destroy this guy's life. The reason why? His life was built on the solid foundation of Jesus and upon his word. Now, we have to remember for context, as we're studying the book of 1 Peter, the context of 1 Peter has to be remembered as Peter writing to a group of believers who were suffering some very, very intense persecution. They were going through storms of life that they had never, ever encountered before. And so Peter's goal is to equip them to overcome these storms instead of being overcome by them. Now, let's just kind of be honest with each other. How many of you have ever been overcome by a storm where your faith failed? And you know as you look back, it's because you didn't have your life built on the solid foundation of Jesus and his word. Amen? That's exactly what happened there. Now, I did some reading this week because we're talking about building our life on the rock building our lives on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. And I read something so boring, it's going to make your life just miserable to even hear this for the next couple of seconds. I read from the Uniform Building Code of the state of South Carolina. You want to talk about some interesting reading. In fact, I even brought a picture of it. This is is the book, the 2015 South Carolina um, Uniform Building Code. And I found a couple of things in this building code, and that's that Every house is required since the mid-50s to be built on a solid foundation, and also it's required that the builder securely attach the frame of the house to the foundation, and the most common way to do that is to use anchor bolts. And this is a specific kind of anchor bolt. There's all sorts of different kinds of anchor bolts, but but these are anchor bolts. Today you learn about construction, and you learn about Jesus, okay? Okay. Now, this is where it gets really interesting, because according to the, the building code that God gives us, which is his word, right? We're going to use a little illustration. I don't do this very often, but this hit me like a ton of bricks this week, and I thought we should do this. Here, here's your life, all right? And, and it's up here somewhere. Here's the solid foundation of Jesus and his word. And what we have here is what would eventually become the frame of the house. This would be called the sill plate. And the the frame of the house would be, you know, standing upright on it. And the builder would take that sill plate, he'd drop it down on the solid foundation using anchor bolts. He'd throw a, a washer and a nut on both sides. And as he does that, he would then take something much bigger than what I'm going to use, I'm just going to use a little crescent wrench. And he would securely attach the house, frame of the house, to the foundation using what? Anchor bolts. And there you go. We've got a solid foundation. You've got what would become the frame of the house. And the only way that these guys can be connected is through these anchor bolts. And what I want to show you this morning from 1 Peter chapter 1, is five or six things that Peter talks to us about that become the anchor bolts that hold our house, our life, to the solid foundation of Jesus. And so this morning, name of our study is, is actually Anchor Bolts, from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, and we have two goals for our study this morning. One is, is we really want to understand the theological truths that 
Peter teaches us in these first nine verses, and and there's about five or six of them. There's actually more, but I'm, I'm trying to combine them for time. We want to understand these theological truths, and then what we want to do is we want to see these truths as the anchor bolts that secure our life to the solid foundation of Jesus, so that when the storms of life come, and when will they come? How often? Pretty often, huh? And if you're a lucero, they come a lot more, it seems like as of late. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at these things that Peter writes to us about, and we're going to see that these are the anchor bolts that hold our house, our life, to the solid foundation of Jesus. So let's talk about these anchor bolts. Read with me 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who were kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, now we're actually going to go all the way to verse 9, but we're going to stop right there because this contains our first couple of anchor bolts. So anchor bolt number one, the, the first thing we find from Peter that holds our house, our life, to the solid foundation of Jesus. Anchor bolt number one, you are not where you are by accident. And this is going to really minister to some people, I think. If you look, verse 1, Peter says that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he writes to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, if you remember, as we studied this last week, Peter's writing to a group of believers that had been driven away from their home, from the place that they had been comfortable in walking with the Lord and living with the Lord and maybe where they grew up, where their family was, where their security was at. And because of persecution, they had been driven into the heart of the Roman Empire. And it wasn't a friendly, a friendly place for first century Christians. The one thing that we know about this group is that many of them, rather than pressing into the Lord and seeing these trials and tribulations as an opportunity for growth, Rather, what they did is they began to pull away from the Lord. They, they began to kind of fall back. They let these trials and tribulations push them away. And what Peter wants us to see is that this was an opportunity in disguise rather than trouble. And I'll show you two opportunities that they had here. It was an opportunity for spiritual growth as they learned to trust in God's grace in the midst of deep trials. How many of you in the midst of deep trials learn so much more about God and his grace? As you read the Psalms, you find that God didn't drive David into the wilderness and give him trials and tribulations to break him, but to bring him to a deeper, more intimate knowledge of himself. This is how God teaches us so much about who he is, is by giving us trials and tribulations. And then it was also an opportunity for these believers to get out of their comfort zone and to get into a place where they could be sharing their faith with the people that God brought them to. So I want you to look around the room for a minute. Just, just take a look around. I, I, I can see everybody, but as I, as I look from up here, man, I see people from all over. If you're from Florida, raise your hand. Okay. If you're from Georgia, raise your hand. If you're from somewhere north of South Carolina, raise your hand. If you're from somewhere west of South Carolina, raise your hand. All right. This room is full of people that God transplanted here from somewhere else for a very specific purpose. And I don't know how often I'll talk to somebody, and they'll say, you know, I have no idea why God has me here. I have no idea why God would uproot me from this place where my family was at, where my career was at, where everything was just going well. And, and, and all of a sudden, God just moves me to Gur, South Carolina, and here I am, and Ever since I got here, I just feel like I don't even know what I'm doing here. I feel like life is just spinning. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why God 
has me here, well, I want you to consider a couple of things. Consider a couple of things. God might have moved you from a comfortable place to this place because where you were at, you were growing complacent. You were growing lethargic in the Lord. You would become a couch potato for Jesus. I was talking to our youth group in Albuquerque one time, and we were preparing for a mission trip to Ukraine, and I was, I was trying to use what was probably not the most godly means to stir kids to sign up to this youth group uh, mission trip. And, and I said, you know, there's, there's two groups of us in this room right now. There's those of us who are sold out to the Lord and willing to do anything and go anywhere, and then there's the rest of us who are blood-sucking mosquitoes for Christ. <laughs> You know, I've grown a little bit since then. I realize guilt and, and it doesn't work real well. But, but this is the thing is that, you know, maybe God had you in a place where he was trying to stir you to a new level of service, a new level of spiritual growth, and you were just totally complacent. And there was no way that was ever going to happen where you were at. And so God says, I got to move you. I got to put you in a new place. And he uproots you and sets you down in a place where you're so uncomfortable And and everything is so different that that all you can do is just press into him and you hear his voice and he says, it's time to get back serious about my kingdom again, again, uh, about the work that I've called you to. But, But there's another reason also, because I see this a lot. Maybe you were really on fire for the Lord and you were extremely effective in the kingdom of God and God says, you know what, I need you in this new place because I'm going to send you to share Christ with non-believers and I'm going to share you to encourage believers that need some fire and some zeal. So, So one way or another, you know, you're right where you are because God moved you here, put you here, did whatever he did in your life to get you here. Just like he had these people in Peter's life and Peter writes to them and they say, Peter, we don't know what's going on. We've been driven from our homes by persecution and we're living in a land where we don't fit. And there's still persecution. And Peter says to them, listen, Acts chapter 8 teaches us that you were driven from there to here in order that you would spread the word of God, in order that you would be faithful to the call that God has put on your life. So, so number one, anchor bolt number one in our lives today, that which attaches our life to the solid foundation of Jesus, don't forget the fact that you are right where God wants you to be today. Even if you don't feel like it, you feel lost, you feel like things are just not going great, Listen, you're right where God wants you to be. Now, now that was the simplest of our anchor bolts. might have even been the most encouraging. Because as we start getting in here, we begin looking at at more and more about the trials. But but I think this is going to be incredibly, you know, an incredible blessing as we look at the second anchor bolt. Look up at the screen. Great title here. Anchor bolt number two. Thing that you really need to know to be securely held to the solid foundation of the Lord. And that is that all three members of the Trinity are actively involved in your life every single day. Look look at verse 2. Peter writes to these suffering saints, and he reminds them that they are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, this is some deep theological water right here. This is swimming in the deep end when it really comes to theology because we're looking at a few things that theologians love to argue about. I don't think there's any need to argue. I think it's very clear. But verse 2, he tells us that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Theologians love to take that and go beyond what it says because what they say is that if if, if we're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, then there's got to be those who were elected not to be saved. But the scripture doesn't say that. The scripture speaks to believers about being chosen. Before we really dig into this, I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, and then prepare to turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. Paul says the same thing to two different churches, the same thing that Peter said here. And in Ephesians 1, I think it's a little clearer than what Peter said. Peter says, that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. But, but notice what Paul says. Ephesians 1.3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy 
and without blame before him in love. Now, flip a few more pages and hit 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want you to see what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. Same thing, just some different words. You take all three of these and you put them together and this becomes so understandable. In 2 Thessalonians 2.13, I'm going to wait because I still hear pages flipping. Okay, everybody must be there. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as you turn back to 1 Peter, let me say this. These three passages that we just looked at, they all say the exact same thing using a little bit different words. But what Paul is saying here, I'm sorry, what Peter is saying here, is that when properly understood, they really become an anchor bolt that secures your life to the solid foundation of Jesus. Another anchor bolt found right here. Let's talk here about the Heavenly Father's involvement in your daily life. Look at verse 3. I'm sorry, verse 2. He says that you are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. In those other verses, that word elect was translated chosen. And so what Peter's telling you is that you are chosen. Your heavenly father chose you to become a son or a daughter of his. Is that amazing? When did he choose you? Well, he chose you before the foundation of the world. Why did he choose you way back when? Spurgeon answers that for us. Spurgeon said, I'm so glad that the father chose me before the foundation of the world Because if he would have chosen me after I was born, he would have never chosen me. (laughs) After he really knew who I was. He, he, uh, I won't even go into more of what Spurgeon said about that. But but look at Jesus' involvement in your life. It's in the middle of verse 2. Jesus' involvement says here that you were chosen for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. This is an illustration from Exodus 24. And, and Moses has met with God, and he's met with the people, and he gives the Israelites the word of God, the law. And he says to them, this is what God requires for you to have a saving relationship with him, that you would be obedient. And the Israelite people said to Moses, we will do it all. And so Moses sacrificed a bull, took some of the blood, and he sprinkled it on the people. And, and it was a covenant made between God and men, And it was sealed in the blood of the sacrificed animal. And what the covenant was, was the people saying, we will obey. We will be an obedient people. Peter builds on that thought from Exodus 24. And he says that when God chose you, the same thing happened. You were sprinkled by the blood of the sacrifice. That was Jesus. It wasn't a physical sprinkling. It was a spiritual event where the blood of Jesus brought healing and forgiveness of sin into your life. As you put these two together, you have the Father choosing you, and you have the blood of Jesus Christ being applied to our our lives. And I want to give you a, a summary statement that I wrote of the Father's role and the Son's role in our salvation. Look up at the screen for just a second. These are my words. These are just my words, just how I understand what we just studied. And I want you to understand that before the foundation of the world... Your heavenly father chose you to become his son or daughter through faith in Jesus. You see, so there was the the choosing that took place by the father, but there was also the exercise of free will on your part when you decided to receive the finished work of Jesus as a gift. And the reason I'm going into this, I think this is really important because as you study theology, you find in the church, and this makes being a Christian very difficult sometimes, you find that there's different camps within the church. You have those who follow Reformed theology and those who are dispensationalists and those who don't really have a theological position. They just kind of fly by the seat of your pants. And and, and on one side of the the fence, you've got those who 
overemphasize the sovereignty of God when it comes to our salvation. And then on the other side of that fence, you have those who overemphasize the free will of man when it comes to our salvation. But what we just read is that both of them play together in order to give us a biblical idea of what salvation is. Now, let me illustrate that for you. If you're one of those people who overemphasize the sovereignty of God when it comes to our salvation, you may believe something like this, that if God chose you, you're going to be saved whether you want to or not. And I get this comical picture of an angel dragging a man into heaven, kicking and screaming, I don't want to go to heaven. And the angel going, doesn't matter. God chose you. You're going to heaven, right? It just doesn't make sense. And then on the other side, you got those who overemphasize the free will of man. And that might look something like this. No matter how badly you want to be saved, and you've repented of your sin, and you've cried out to Jesus, but some voice comes down from heaven and says, I'm sorry, you can't be saved because you are not chosen. And again, that doesn't fit the character of God either. So if you can do this, and this is hard for us human beings, but if we can set aside man's theology and we can just go back to what the written word of God simply teaches, what you find is that our salvation is the combination of the sovereignty of God where he chose us and the free will of man where we chose him back by putting our faith in the finished work of Jesus and we get this beautiful picture of what salvation looks like. And I hope that as you're sitting here today, you realize I have been chosen before the foundation of the world to be a son or a daughter of the king And I've reacted and responded to that choosing by putting my faith in the finished work of Jesus. And that anchors me to the solid foundation, and therefore my salvation is unshakable. It it means that I completely trust in the finished work of Jesus, but I also know that I was chosen before the foundation of the world. God loves me so much that he chose me. And then he gave me the ability to, to choose him. But now I want to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in our daily lives. If you look right again in the middle of verse 2, we get these words hand in hand with what we just studied in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience. Now, I want to share another statement with you. I found a real cool meme on the internet. I know we've all heard this, but let me put this up on the screen real quick. I think you've seen this before. God loves you just the way you are but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. You realize that's 100% biblical. That, that is completely biblical. I love the fact that when, when I got saved, the day I got saved, I was a wretch. I was a mess. And a moment after I got saved, the only thing that was different is that I had been forgiven. I had been given a new heart. I had been cleansed. But I know that the moment after I got saved, I still struggled with everything I struggled with 10 seconds earlier. Didn't you? And, and so the Lord says to us, okay, you were a mess, and then I got you, and you were still a mess, and now I have you. But I'm not going to leave you this way. So the Father says, I chose you before the foundation of the world. You put your faith in the finished work of Jesus, and then I sent my Holy Spirit to start this lifelong process that we call sanctification, where he changes you into the image of my son, Jesus. And so he says here, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience. So when we talk about being saved, and and I, I know that we all probably make this mistake, but I often tell the story of when I got saved. I was 12 or 13 years old. I don't really remember. That's a bad thing, isn't it? But I was 12 or 13 years old. I came out of the Catholic Church. I went to a Baptist youth group. I heard the gospel. I fell in love with the Word of God. I prayed to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And you know what happened? I got, say it out loud, saved, right? But then that's oftentimes very tricky because we start thinking about salvation as something that took place on what we call our spiritual birth date. But according to Scripture, the the word salvation is used all sorts of different ways. I want to give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's just think about salvation from the Father's point of view. In the Father's point of view, You were saved before the foundation of the world when he chose you. Isn't that awesome? So I can say, man, I've been saved since I was 12 or 13. And the father goes, no, 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 no. Let's just, let's talk young earth, okay? 
let's say the earth is just about 6,000 years old. I'm just, just, all right. Father is saying, before I created the heavens and the earth, about 6,000 or so years ago, that's when you were saved in my mind. Now, we talk from Jesus' point of view. From Jesus' point of view, I have been saved since he died on the cross to pay for my sin. So I say I've been saved since I was 12. And what, about 16 years ago? And then Jesus looks at it and he says, no, 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 no. You've been saved for just a little over 2,100 years. I'm thinking, wow, that's crazy. In Jesus' mind, I've been saved since he died on the cross to pay for me. The Holy Spirit looks at me every morning and he goes, what a mess. You're going to be saved when I'm done with you. And you see the Father and his Son face to face. And I know the Father thinks you've been saved for over 6,000 years. And to Jesus, you've been saved for 2,100 years. The Holy Spirit looks at me and he goes, we're still working on this. I mean, positionally, yeah, Randy, you're saved. But, but practically... You are being saved. That salvation that the Father gave to you, the Spirit says, I'm working it into you day in and day out. How? Well, look at Romans 8, 28. Did I tell you to mark Romans 8? Go there anyway. This is is one that if you don't underline your Bible, you need to start today. You need to see this one in your own Bible. Romans 8, and we all quote verse 28, especially when someone's going through a hard time. Oh, my car just got stolen. Well, brother... All things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and the call of the... No, right? We always use that. And it's wonderful to be the giver of Romans 8.28, but when your car just got stolen, does it really feel that good to have another believer come? Because then you have to act spiritual. Amen, brother. Can you give me a ride to work tomorrow, okay? The guy's going, sorry, I don't got time. And I'm going, wait a minute, I thought that this worked for... Okay, anyways... Look at Romans 8.28, and then we'll look at 29. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. That's us, ladies and gentlemen. That's those of us who know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But verse 29 and 30 are so important. For whom he foreknew, and you go, wait a minute. I know, First Peter chapter 1, Ephesians, Second Thessalonians. He foreknows me. He chose me. So this is me. So, so for those that he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among, among many brethren. And moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. So when the father saved you and the son saved you, And the Holy Spirit looks and he goes, wait, I'm in the process of saving you. You ask the Holy Spirit, how are you working in my life? And he says, through every circumstance that comes your way, through the flat tire and through the blessing, I'm using those things to bring you to this place that the Holy Spirit wants to call maturity, completeness, to where that positional salvation that Jesus earned for you on the cross and the Father gave to you as a free gift becomes a practical part of your everyday life where we are actually transformed into the image of Jesus. So our second anchor bolt that we looked at this morning is this, is that God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. Absolutely refuses to leave you there. So that means that in order to set this anchor bolt in the solid foundation of Jesus and and, and build your house upon that foundation, you're going to have to embrace this truth and you're going to have to remember that the Holy Spirit is using every event in your life to train you to be more like Jesus, to work into you the character of Jesus. And you know what that tells us we need to stop doing? We have to stop complaining about every little thing that happens, don't we? I wonder if we complain and the Holy Spirit goes, well, that's fine, but we'll just go around this mountain again. He wants us to learn to rejoice, and we're going to see that as we go on. So anchor bolt number two, Father loves you, chose you, but he doesn't want you to stay the way you are. He wants to transform you. That brings us to anchor bolt number three that we're putting in the foundation today, and that is that patient endurance now here on earth equals an immeasurable inheritance 
later in eternity. This is good. Look at this. Verse 3. Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, that's a mouthful, and that's a whole study by itself. There's a whole Sunday morning sitting in those verses right there. But this is what we need to know because we're going to kind of buzz through it so that we can just make this an anchor bolt. These believers that Peter was writing to, I want you to to remember, they had lost their homes. They had lost their jobs. They had had to walk out on their family because they were being persecuted. They had given up all of their earthly possessions. They were living as strangers and aliens in a foreign land, and some of them were on the verge of giving up hope. They, They were ready to quit. They're ready to walk away from their faith because they were starting to believe that it was just too hard to be a Christian. Anybody ever been there? It's really hard to be a Christian. Yeah, we've been, I've been there. So twice as many people as as raised their hands have actually been there or more. Most of us are just too tired from the trials of life to get our hand up right now. (laughs) It's really true. These guys are getting ready to lose hope in the Lord. They were losing hope that that things were going to ever get better. And so Peter begins to talk to them about this thing called, if you look down here in verse 3, a living hope. Do you see it there? Who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, they were living without hope. And Peter comes along and he says, you've got no hope and it's because of your circumstances. So I just want to remind you of a couple of things. You have a living hope. This living hope is the fact that Jesus died on a cross, went into a grave, and then he came out of the grave to give you hope. And he tells us a couple of things that resulted in this living hope. First came the Father's abundant mercy. You see that in verse 3. Because of the Father's abundant mercy and because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we get to have a living hope. We're blessed with a living hope. And I want you to think about Jesus for a minute. Oftentimes we don't really have a, a biblical perspective, so we need to remind ourselves of this. The reading of the book of Philippians reminds you every time. But before Jesus was here on earth as the man Jesus, he lived in the throne room of God as the worshipped Son of God. Do you you remember that, right? He had the best life of anybody who has ever existed in the universe. He was the son of the creator, worshipped by angels, worshipped by the inhabitants of heaven, and that was his daily existence. And then one day the father says to him, you know that plan we have to redeem mankind? Yes. We're going to put that plan in action today, and we're going to send you down there to become one of them. Can you imagine that? Being the God of the universe, God the Son, and now you have to become one of us. And he comes to earth, and he suffers as a little baby. Can you imagine being the king of the universe and then having to have somebody change your diaper and feed you and teach you how to walk and all of those things? I mean, think about Jesus. And he gets to the earth... He becomes an adult. He starts teaching the Hebrew people that he was promised to thousands of years before, that he's the promised Messiah. And a majority of them reject him to the point that they arrest him. They mock him and they beat him. And they kill him on a Roman cross. And they take his body and they put it in the grave. And what seems like the lowest point of the story becomes the turning point for the greatest part of the story because having gone into the grave, he now bursts forth in victory and becomes the risen son of God. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead mixed with the Father's abundant mercy becomes the reason that we get to have a living hope. It's a living hope. It's, it's not a dead hope. I know if we went around the room today and said, listen, what are, you, what are you trusting in? What are you hoping in right now? Somebody might say something like, that my car will just get me through another month. You know, I'm praying that the money in the bank 
would just, you know, get me to the end of the month. You know, we would have all these carnal things. And when we look at Scripture, we say, our hope is in the king that went into the grave and came back out of the grave. He is a living, resurrected king. And, amen. First Peter 1, 4, and 5 we read a couple of things about our future inheritance that came because of his suffering. Notice that we have an inheritance that is incorruptible, it's undefiled, and it does not fade away. It is reserved in heaven for you. That's a little bit better than your car making it to the end of the month. That's a little bit more than the bank account not bursting by the end of the month. We have an inheritance, look at this, incorruptible. Incor- I mean, it can never go bad. It's undefiled. It does not fade away, and it's reserved in heaven. It's not earthly. It's waiting for us in the future. Look at the second thing. It's found in verse 5. It's kept for those who are, I'm sorry, it's reserved in heaven for those of us who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The interesting thing about kind of giving ourselves over to earthly riches and earthly hopes. You notice that you have to maintain everything you get? Have you noticed that? I just sold a bunch of stuff this last month because I just got sick of maintaining it. I had a camper and a jet ski, and so I, I just got sick and tired of maintaining I got sick of the overhead. I got sick of every time it rained, wondering, is the roof of the camper going to leak like the last camper leaked? It cost me two weeks of my life to get in there and gut the camper and fix it and sell the thing, and it just... I got sick and tired of it. I just, everything I own requires maintenance and insurance and fuel and upkeep. You know the cool thing about your salvation? Look who keeps it up. It is kept by the power of God. God does the maintenance on what God gives you. And it's, it's an eternal salvation I feel so much better not having the overhead of a couple of things I got rid of in the last couple of months, past couple of weeks, I should say. So this is what Peter's trying to show us here, guys, is that if we patiently endure now, we have a measurable inheritance in the future. But if we pour ourselves into the things of this world, we've got nothing to look forward to. And that's our anchor bolt. Our third one, our hope is in the heavenly inheritance that Jesus' resurrection has forever secured for us. I want you to see this. On your worst day, the Lord still loves you as much as he ever did. As much as he ever, ever did. Our fourth anchor bolt is found in verses 6 through 9. And we're going to call this anchor bolt this. My grief today results in Jesus' glory tomorrow. This is a great anchor bolt. Look at verse 6. Peter says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, You have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls." Now, the believers that Peter was writing to, remember, they were facing, notice it says here in verse 6, various trials. You know what that means is that they weren't all facing the same thing. And so oftentimes, you know, when we're talking to each other, we can't really relate to the fact that someone is going through something specific and we're going through something different. But what we need to see is that everybody's going through something and in need of the Lord to give them strength. So we talk to each other, and, you know, we have conversation. How's it going? I don't know. It's kind of been a rough week. What happened? They tell you, and then you can't wait. Maybe don't even listen to them. As soon as they're done talking, you blurt out what's wrong with your life, you know. And then we just kind of want to outdo each other. Well, I got six flat tires. Well, I got eight flat tires. Well, when I was changing the tire, a semi came by and knocked my car off the jack. Well, mine flipped over, you know. And, and, and you're trying, but Peter's trying to say this to the believers. Listen. Have some perspective. Everybody's suffering. Everybody's going through a tough time, and, and, and Peter wants us to, to have compassion towards each other, to, to minister to one another. But what he really wants us to see is that this is normal life, that, that grief and going through trials, we, we just consider this 
normal, and it, it has a very specific purpose behind it. Look at verse 7. He tells us this is why God allows us to go through trials. He says that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Think of the picture he's drawing. I just want you to pretend that you're going down to one of these stores where they buy gold. They're popping up everywhere, aren't they? It must be a good business. Well, let's just say you're having a rough month, and you decide, I'm just going to take this, this thing I've got. It says 14 karat gold, and I'm going to go sell it, and I'm just going to get a few, few bucks to get to the end of the month. So you go walking in there, and you tell the guy, how much is this 14 karat gold ring worth? And he goes, well, how do you know it's 14 karat gold? And you say, well, it says right there. He says, any any ring can claim to be 14 karat gold. We're going to put it through a series of tests to see if it's really 14 karat gold. And if you've ever done this, they, they take a little block and they put a chemical on it and then they just rub the ring on it so a little bit of the gold comes off. And determined by or by, by what color it turns, they can determine whether it's true or not. And so he, he puts it on there and he goes, yeah, this is actually what it claims to be and therefore it's worth this much. Now, now I tell you this because this is what Peter's saying. We got a room full of people here who claim that we're Christians. We, we claim that we have faith in Jesus. And Peter comes along and he says, well, there's an acid test. The acid test for Christianity is how you endure a trial. And, and he says here, check this out. He says that a trial comes that the genuineness of your faith may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When you go through a trial and your faith is proven to be true because you endure the trial, Peter comes along and he says, you suffer now and it brings praise, honor, and glory to Jesus when he shows up here on earth to redeem you, to come get you. So, so you're going, man, it seems like there's a lot of suffering going on and And you can look at it and you can say, it's more and more opportunity for our lives to bring glory to Christ when he comes back. Now, there's nothing more disturbing, and and I've been thinking about this a lot lately. There's nothing more disturbing than watching a believer go through a trial who has no faith and who has no hope. They, They go through trials and it just seems like the whole world is crashing down. They don't have a biblical perspective. They don't have any idea why God might be allowing this. And so this is what oftentimes happens. They go, God doesn't love me anymore. God has quit loving me, and and, and therefore, I don't know if I can continue. I'm not going to go to church anymore. I'm not going to read my Bible anymore. I'm not going to pray anymore because God doesn't love me anymore. Peter comes along, and he says, listen, suffering now has a purpose later. Turn to Romans 5. This is the last time I'll ask you to turn in your Bible this morning. We'll draw this to a close. So we're about to look at our final anchor bolt before we prepare our hearts for communion. In Romans 5, around verse 3, in verse 2, Paul is writing to the Romans and he says that we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Don't, don't you rejoice when you're thinking about Jesus coming back? Don't you rejoice when you think about the person of Jesus and you're rejoicing and you're rejoicing? Paul takes it a step further in Romans 5, 3. He says, not only that, But we also glory in tribulations. What a sick man. Paul has it going. Oh, it's glorious. Why? I'm suffering. (laughs) We don't do that around here, do we? I mean, every once in a while, we'll pull a guy aside and say, listen, I want you to pray for me. I'm I'm going through a lot. But, man, I'm just, like, I'm, I'm able to, like, stand, and I'm excited about this trial. So just pray for me that it lasts, right? But Paul's just coming right out, and he says, we glory in tribulations. This is great, man. This is a great place to be. Suffering is great, Paul says. And you say, why, Paul? Look what he says. He says, we know that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces, say it out loud, hope. It's the whole thing we've been talking about today, this living hope. So Paul comes along and he starts talking about the fact that these trials, these tribulations, they bring into our life three or four things. Perseverance, you can endure for a long time. 
You do that for a while, it teaches you character. And by the time you've persevered and you've learned character, Paul says, now you understand hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us, he goes on to say. So as we kind of draw this to a close, we'll look at our final anchor bolt here. Back in First Peter. Our fourth anchor bolt that we just looked at is simply learning to persevere through the storms of life turns out to be an act of worship to the Lord. The way that we deal with a trial, a tribulation, a test, it turns out to be an act of worship to the Lord. So I'm going to review the last four anchor bolts. I'm going to give you the fifth, and we're going to prepare our hearts for communion this morning. First anchor bolt that we set into the solid foundation of Jesus and we're ready to attach our our life to is that you're right where God wants you to be and don't miss out on what God has for you there. Don't run from where God has you and miss out on what he's got you there for. The second anchor bolt is that God chose you. and I mean, that should just make you smile. He chose you before the foundation of the earth. He paid for your salvation through the blood of Jesus, and he sent the Holy Spirit to transform you into the image of Jesus. That is an amazing anchor bolt for us to attach to today. The third is that we have an incorruptible inheritance waiting in heaven, so we have to be careful not to pour too much of ourselves into the things of this earth, because this is not what we're living for. And the fourth that we just looked at is that whatever we suffer today, it has a purpose, and eventually it's going to bring us to a place of maturity. It's going to bring glory to Jesus. And the last anchor bolt, we're going to just look back at the introduction, the end of verse 2. I saved this for now. If you get these other four anchor bolts set in your life, you attach your house to the foundation through these four things, you're going to automatically experience the fifth. And that is the simple words at the end of verse 2, the multiplication of God's grace and his peace in your life. Look at these words that Peter writes. He says, grace to you and peace be multiplied. When the grace of God is poured into our lives, the peace of God is multiplied. It just continues to grow and it continues to overwhelm us. So, so here's where we're at. From this point on in First Peter, we're going to dig a little bit deeper than we have. We're going to dig into some, some word by word and verse by verse of Peter's um, powerful book. But I wanted, to, I wanted to approach this today because this is what I, this is what I see so often. Believers are, are facing trials, but they keep getting blown off the foundation. And then they come back to the Lord and another trial comes and they get blown back off the foundation again. And then they get their house reestablished and and guess what comes along? Another storm of life and what happens? The house gets blown off the foundation. We've got to have these anchor bolts that Peter gives us, these theological truths that anchor us to the person of Jesus that no trial, no storm, no anything can can crash can can blow us off. It's just not going to happen. You, you need to get your own anchor bolts. And they they're right here in 1 Peter chapter 1. 